Thank you so much to all of you who are joining us today um, to talk about how to support your child while applying to college. Uh, we really wanted to put together this parent-focused webinar um, specifically to help all of you get a better sense of what you can be doing while your child is going through this admittedly often stressful, um, but also very rewarding and fulfilling experience. Um, so we're gonna be talking about preparation, application timelines, expectations, both for you and for your child or children who might be going through this, um, and then some advice uh, from our, our very experienced advisors here. Um, so today we are going to have Lauren and Leah who are leading our, our presentation. Um, Lauren is our Director of College Advising. If any of you are working with us, you probably are familiar with her. Um, she's a former admissions officer from Williams College um, and has, also, has spent many, many years working with students um, in the college consulting field. Uh, Leah comes to us from Boston University and MIT admissions offices um, and is really excited to be working with our students as a college advisor here. Um, so I'm going to leave it up to them to take it away. Um, a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Um, just so you know, we do have a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen here. Please ask questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A box. We will take some time at the end to review and respond to all of your questions. Um, so don't forget to, to add those in. And then we'll also be sending out a link to our survey at the end of the presentation as well. We'd love to hear your feedback. Um, if you found this helpful, if you feel like it could have been better, please let us know and we'd love to hear from you. Um, so take it away, Lauren and Leah. Hi there. So today we're going to be discussing the, some topics, and this is just a bit of a flow of our presentation. So first, we're going to talk a little bit about what to expect from the college advising process, um, some tips for parents, um, how we can effectively work together as a team, both parents and logic prep. We'll walk you a bit through the application cycle timeline so you know what to expect um, from the calendar once your student hits that application cycle. And then a little bit about student and parent responsibilities um, before we turn it over to answering questions from you all. Welcome everyone. I am so happy to be here this evening with you. I want to say before I get started, and I appreciate Olivia's um, introduction, I, I come at this and tonight's presentation from a couple of different perspectives. One is, yes, I am a very experienced college advisor. Um, the other is that I'm a parent of two college students. So um, I feel like all of my years of, of college advising did not actually prepare me all that well for having my own children go through the process. So I'm, I'm hoping to share a little bit of my, uh, my perspective this evening as well. Um, I, I, as you are going through this process, I think it's important to know what to expect. And having said that, I think it's important to understand that no matter what you expect, things are going to look a little bit different. Um, so the application process for, for students and families, um, I, I have this slide that says it can create stress for parents and children. Let's rephrase that and say it will create stress for, for parents and children. Um, there's no right or wrong way to get through this and you will experience some stress in the process. It also requires a, a tremendous amount of patience as you navigate uh, an uncertain landscape, support your children and handle your own um, processes as well. The process can be exciting and hopefully is going to be mostly exciting and it can be a little bit sad. <clears throat> we're, we're very aware that as you're supporting your children in the application process, you're also supporting their increasing independence and their inevitable um, process of leaving home, which is bittersweet for everybody. It's important that this process not consume your entire relationship with your child. Um, it can feel like it's the only important thing in your lives and uh, it definitely is not. And most importantly, we don't want it to define your child's sense of self and pride and joy in their accomplishments. 
four years of high school, all of the years leading up to that point to those college acceptances uh, should not be boiled down to what school they got into as the sole reflection of what they've accomplished and achieved in that time. It's also a very fluid process. Things are going to feel easy and hard and everything in between. Decisions are going to be made and unmade and remade. So it does require a fair bit of flexibility throughout the process. And thankfully, it does come to an end. Your child will get through this, you will get through this, and ultimately your child will be heading off to college and you can look back with a breath of relief. So as, as kind of this process unfolds, I wanted to share just some, some tips, um, which may not work for everybody, but I do think it's important for parents to find a community. And by that, I mean a non-competitive, fully supportive community of peers or family who are going to be really invested in your success and your child's success and not make it... Um, a comparative relationship. We also really encourage you as parents to be mindful of your own thoughts and feelings, not take your stress and put it on your on your children. Um, certainly allow yourself the space to feel everything and experience everything in this process as they go through it and you go through it with them, but just be aware of, of what it is you're feeling. We also hope that you'll keep perspective. Um, a, a lot of people, I think, get very committed to the idea that where their child gets into college or ultimately goes to college is going to be the defining moment of their collective family lives. Um, we hope that you recognize many, many successes along the way and understand um, the importance of, of really embracing whatever outcome your child receives as the best path forward. Whatever you're feeling, your kid is feeling it so much worse. Um, so I think it's important just to remember, uh, I mean, we've all read endless articles about the amount of, of stress and anxiety that our uh, teens are feeling. So I think just to be aware of that is, is crucially important. And we, we know this intellectually, but continuing to remind yourself and, and others as needed that where your child gets in does not in fact define their worthiness or their intelligence or their potential to achieve greatness in their lives. We also really hope you're going to support your child's growing independence. It, it can be very tempting to take over ownership of the process and moving it forward. Ultimately, when they get to college, you are not going to be there to do their homework for them, to remind them to do their homework, to sit with them while they're doing their homework. So the more we can do to uh, help them develop these independent work habits and skills, the better off they'll be once they actually get to college. We also, and this was something that someone had passed on to me when I was going through this, and I was extremely grateful for it. I really encourage you all to designate college talk times, you know, an hour on Sunday and Tuesday at seven. Um, it's very easy for every dinner time conversation and every car ride to get absorbed with, did you send in this? Did you finish that? Have you talked to your teacher about a recommendation? And it really can preserve the family unit when you're setting aside discrete times to talk about the college application process. And I, I, this is very related to other things we've already talked about, but feel the excitement, even if the process isn't going to look exactly like what you want it to or what you thought it would, um, and, and feel some of the sadness as well. We all have regrets about things maybe we should have done differently to position our children better, things we wish they had done differently to position themselves better. Um, so definitely there's a gamut of emotion and it's okay to feel all of it. And ask for help. We are here specifically for this reason, to support you and to support your children in this process. And really, there's there's nothing we're not willing to talk to you about. 
So I wanted to go over some um, some advice or expectations on how parents can work together effectively as a team with your logic prep team, your certainly your college advisor, but um, whomever else, you know, tutors, um, test prep that you might be working with at logic prep as well. Um, so first I wanted to discuss some points about communication. Um, you will receive lots of regular communication with from logic prep throughout your experience working with us. Um, we do this to help maintain transparency, provide progress updates, raise concerns, and invite feedback from you. Sometimes these emails might even include invitations for you to join a meeting with your child and members of the logic prep team to discuss um, progress and next steps. Please read these emails sent by your academic and college advisors to stay up to date about about um, everything we're discussing with your student and to learn ways that you can continue supporting them. Next, we ask you to please be transparent with any information that could affect outcomes, um, perhaps in the test score realm or with their college admissibility um, as well. Um, so specifically, parents should share any material changes to your students' well-being, academic performance, um, if there's something major like a change of school, a student disciplinary action, um, an official test registration, test scores, um, or any new accommodations that your student may have, or anything that you think might might just be worthwhile sharing with us um, to give us some context that might help us guide them um, or um, just work with them on a one on one basis. Um, sharing this information is so important so that we can help you and your student make informed decisions about the college search and the application process. And please keep the lines of communication open. If you have questions or concerns, we really want to know. So you can always contact your college advisor directly. Um, and additionally, you're always welcome to reach out to Lauren, who again is our director of college advising. Um, we, we always want to hear from you and, and make sure that we're taking into consideration all of your thoughts and questions so you feel well informed. Next, some points about accountability. Um, so sometimes we will ask you to complete action steps um, that will help support your child's application. Um, as independent and as prepared as your child may be, some things they simply can't do without you. <laughs> and other times um, there are areas where they may need extra support. So, um, you know, maybe helping sign your student up for an upcoming test is somewhere where they might need a little extra help. But filling out a form like the early decision parent agreement is something that they need your assistance with in order to continue on their college application process. And when necessary, um, we, we'll ask you for your support to hold your child accountable for the work that they need to do in order to achieve their goals. Um, there is a lot of outside work um, outside of our meetings that we're asking your students to complete, whether that's writing through the essay process, um, working on drafts of activities lists, um, or doing their college research. There's a lot of work that happens outside of our meetings as well. Um, so if you notice your student has an upcoming appointment with their advisor, um, it may be helpful to ask them if they've done any homework that might be due. Um, similarly, after a meeting, we'll always email reports that outline tasks that we want students to do before their next meeting. So if you're reading that email, you know, it might be nice to follow up with your student to make sure that it's on their radar too, that they have homework to do um, and tasks to complete complete. Um, yeah. And so next we we ask that you trust us. <laughs> um, here at Logic Prep, um, we're really committed to helping your child determine the best path to achieve their goals, whether that be through their test pet game plan or what to emphasize in applications. And we know that there are endless amounts of information and advice about the college applications out there. 
Um, but the benefit of logic prep is that you have professionals with years of experience in the field who are providing individualized guidance throughout this process, specifically for your student. Um, so we're taking all of our expertise and we're also um, tailoring that to your specific students' goals and needs as well. We also ask you to keep an open mind about your students' school list. Um, your Logic Prep team will ensure that your student has schools that are reach schools, target schools, and schools that they're likely to be admitted to, um, to make sure that they're going to have great options that they're excited about. Um, so we ask you to not get um, too stuck into any one specific school and really keep an open mind about schools that might be able to provide your student um, with the experience that they're looking for that can support their goals in different ways. And we also ask just to refrain from reviewing application drafts, whether that be essays or extracurricular lists until your logic prep team um, lets you know that they're ready for comments. Um, it's always a work in progress. And just because something doesn't look like a final product um, when you're looking at it, it might be because it's not the final product. Um, so, and we ask that, um, you know, you, this also includes refraining from sending drafts to other editors um, until logic prep, your logic prep team suggests they're ready um, so that we can um, continue guiding your student the, the way our expertise is telling us to do. And so next I wanted to just give, or Lauren and I together are gonna to give you a preview of what the application um, cycle timeline and calendar looks like. So this timeline that we're showing you today really begins from the, the spring before, or April, May before your student will actually be submitting those applications. Um, so, what will they be working on in April and May, that spring before? Um, they're going to be completing their activities list, which is a required component of the application. It includes up to 10 activities and five different honors. Uh, we work closely with them to strategize how to highlight the most salient information in a very tight character limit. Um, and there really is a, a, a bit of technique to it. Um, and so we work with your student closely on that. They're going to be creating a resume. This is really important for requesting teacher recommendations and is very helpful to provide in potential college interviews as well. Um, students will be working on researching their college list. Um, this can include um, spending lots of time on websites, attending online or virtual information sessions and tours, and also creating plans for college visits with you all. <laughs> um, and we'll also be helping your student request teacher letters of recommendation. Um, when, when done well, um, asking teachers to write academic letters of recommendation involves providing a lot of information to them about your student. Um, teachers are really great at knowing who students are within the classroom, but providing them that resume can also help remind them of all the wonderful things that they do with outside the classroom and how they contribute to their community. Most teachers write these letters over the summer break, so it's important that they're requested before everyone departs for that time. Just want to say um, two quick things about the teacher recommendations. One is that um, part of the reason to ask in the spring is that especially the most popular teachers have to set limits on the number of students they'll write mm -hmm. for. So waiting can be a little bit risky if, if we're able to help your child identify two good teachers to ask. Second thing is just my little pet peeve about the teacher recommendations or my, I don't know, request. Um, mm -hmm. Teachers don't get paid for the time that they're spending writing letters of recommendation. It's what they do above and beyond teaching in the classroom. So a handwritten thank you note, a gift card, something from your student at the end of the cycle, it's a little gesture and it can be very meaningful to the teachers to be recognized for the work they are, they are putting in to support your, your children. 
Um, as we start talking about the timeline, I want to kind of reiterate what I said before about this being a fluid process. Students are moving through it at slightly different places, or sorry, paces. Sometimes one task is getting done ahead of another, depending on the particular student and the particular issue at hand. So if, you know, we are at the end of May, and if you're looking at the April to May thinking, oh my gosh, my student has not done some of these things or has not finished some of these things, I want to assure you that's absolutely okay. If we are sensing any kind of danger signs that your student is not moving through this process in a personally appropriate way for them, that is going to get them to the finish line on time with everything in perfect condition, you will know about it. Um, you you have our word. We are on top of this process with, with your child. Um, this is the time of, of the process when the fun stuff, the kind of the, the meaty part of the process begins. This is when your child is being assigned their essay coach. So most of you should have gotten emails already about this. Um, if you haven't, they are forthcoming. You can also talk to your college advisor. But as you know, at Logic Prep, our students are paired with their primary college advisor and then with a, a designated essay coach who is a professional writer who has tons of experience working with students on the college application essays, which are significantly different from school papers. So they really have a knack for pulling that, that narrative, that personal story from the student in a way that is going to make a very cohesive and compelling college application. So the college, the, the essay coaching, the pairing is happening. Um, throughout the next couple of months, the common application personal statement is the focus of the process with the essay coach, where your student, your child, and your uh, child's essay coach are meeting ideally weekly, um, really working on developing the narrative, fleshing out the personal statement, doing the drafts and revisions required to make a very strong and compelling statement, which should reach its final state around August. We understand some students have summer uh, obligations that require a lot of travel, may not have great access to internet. So we really, this is where you can come in to encourage your child to do a lot of independent work um, and to work very closely and reliably with the essay coach when they are able to do so. Uh, college advisors are working with students on the common application where we're starting to create accounts with kids, starting to get the common application filled out. The common app application, the, the bulk of it is something we begin working on with students now. Um, however, the common app reboots um, and re uh, goes live, regenerates on August 1st. And that's when it's loaded with all the updated school specific supplements and information. So that part of it, we can look at with students and spend some time on, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on that for now. We're also helping your students refine their college lists and work on their their application strategy if they're going to be applying to a college early decision or early action. That's something we're determining now with their input, ideally with your input as well, um, so that we have some clarity about the best approach for the college applications with the best possible outcome. We're also helping students with counselor recommendations, um, especially in the US, a lot of high schools have students and parents fill out information, required information that will enable the counselor to write a very strong kind of comprehensive and detailed letter in support of your student. Um, but your college advisors helping your student determine what is the best way to get this letter and um, how, how can we make it be as fulsome as possible? Um, okay, so we're also um, in, as we move from um, August through September and October, 
um, we're really refining and finishing all early applications. We are making sure that all the school specific supplements are, are perfected and ready to go. Um, we are making sure we are completely on uh, in line with early application and early decision um, agreements with between students and, and parents and often the schools and the school counselors as well. We're making decisions about standardized test scores, whether to submit them as a part of the application um, across the board, certain applications, or whether to withhold them entirely. If your student has determined that they are going to be test optional already, that's a conversation that they've had with their, with their counselor. Um, that's something we continue to advise on. So this is also um, in the early fall is when interviews typically start coming into play. Uh, not every college you are going to be applying to requires or even offers interview. Um, most places don't require them. If they're optional and they offer them, we're gonna help you figure out the best approach for whether to ask for these interviews and how best to prepare for them. Our goal, if your student is applying to early action or early, de uh, early decision schools, is to get those applications submitted um, by about October 20th. There are exceptions to that. If your student is applying early action to UNC, for example, University of North Carolina, that deadline is October 15th. But again, you can be very confident your college advisor is completely on top of that. Um, but yes, for any early schools, we want those applications in well before the deadline, which is usually around November 1st. So once we come into November and December, so late fall, early winter, um, students will be working on completing any early application interviews, as well as sending thank yous. Um, it's very important to follow up um, with those interviewers to thank them for their time, whether they actually work for the admissions office and are very busy reading applications, or they're an alumni volunteer who is taking time out of their busy schedule. Um, it's always a wonderful opportunity for students, so we encourage them to send their thank yous. Um, students will also complete any non-common app applications. <laughs> so there are, um, common app is called that because it is a common application platform that most colleges and universities use, but not every college and university uses the common application. The University of California system is a very large one. So if your student is applying to any UC schools or, um, you know, there are some other ones out there. My former employer, MIT, uses their own application. So they are out there. Um, and if, if a student hasn't already submitted Submitted that um, application early. Um, they'll be making sure that they're completing those applications for regular. Some of those regular deadlines could be November 30th or De December 1st, like the UC system. So that's something that um, students will be will be working on at this time as well. Um, so the goal for that is by November 15th, students should be submitting any. December 1 deadline applications. Um, certificates of finance um, for um, international families. This is a document that colleges required um, that asks them to demonstrate sufficient funds for one year of university. Um, so oftentimes that will include both a form that the university requires as well as a bank letter um, our team based in brazil um, if, if that's where you're coming from they they help coordinate with families throughout the fall um, to make sure they understand what the letter needs to say um, what to ask for your bank from um, to make sure that all of that is ready to go when the time comes to submit that um, in mid-December, um, students who applied to either early decision or early action will start getting decisions. Um, so again, we say mid-December, it, it can be a, a bit of a, a range. So we encourage students not to get too anxious while they're awaiting those. Um, and 
It might be excellent news where your student has been admitted. This might mean that you're done with actually submitting applications, um, you know, especially if that's binding. Um, if, if your student has been admitted to a binding early action program, um, they will need to rescind applications from other universities that they may have submitted. Um, if, if they didn't receive an admitted decision or if they received a non-binding admitted decision, you know, that's when we'll regroup and discuss what the game plan is moving forward um, if deferred. Um, and that's when we'll also make decisions about submitting any ED2, so that's early decision two applications. It's kind of a second chance at those binding opportunities to really demonstrate that interest in those specific universities and regular options as well. And the goal for submission of all of that is before those winter breaks start on December 20th um, to make sure that um, all of those components are done. This is also a really great goal because if you do need something from a teacher or a counselor, you definitely want to make sure that you're getting that before everybody goes on break um, and not trying to contact them while they are on break. And then we go into early next year um, in January and February, students will who may have been deferred from earlier or early decision schools can submit letter, letters of continued interest just to let those colleges and universities know that um, they are still actively interested if um, they should admit them and really hopefully just make sure that they know that they're still engaged in their process. Students will also make sure to request any mid-year grades or reports from their school counselor. This is very important for colleges because this will be the most recent academic information that they have, especially if your student is deferred. The reason why they were deferred may be that they want to see some additional academic information. So it's very important that a student um, make sure that their school is sending this. Um, some schools also ask for a mid-year report that the student may have to fill out as well, so we'll make sure to be on top of that with your child as well. And of course, any regular um, decision timeline or early decision to interviews may, may be happening at this time. And um, just to reiterate, we'll work with them to make sure that they're sending all of their thank you emails as well. Final thoughts on the timeline, Lauren? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so I um, just want to say one thing about mid-year grades, and Leah covered those. I just, this is a, a good segue to talk about end of year grades for students on the U.S. academic mm -hmm. calendar. Um, colleges, whatever college your child has chosen to attend will see, will insist on seeing final grades. Um, so we just really remind students to please be mindful of that. I mean, you don't have to maintain absolutely perfect grades across the board, nor do you want your grades to change too drastically. Um, the other note, which our advisors will be talking with your students about, but just for you as parents to be aware of, is that colleges are very savvy about social media and very concerned about social media behavior. Um, so I would definitely recommend as early as now that you start having the conversation with your children to kind of back up your college advisor um, that they really be certain their social media is clean, not using any derogatory language, not posting anything wildly inappropriate or even illegal um, because students every year do lose acceptances for exactly those reasons. Um, on the bright side, however, from about March to April next year, um, you, you will be getting lots of news from regular decision schools, um, from schools perhaps your, your child applied to early action and maybe was deferred from, um, or early decision deferrals, where your child is either going to be admitted, uh, is going to be offered a spot on the wait list, or is going to be denied. So once you have that pool of colleges of acceptances, then it's time to choose the college. 
Colleges are great at organizing admitted student events, whether virtual or otherwise. We highly recommend students do these programs whenever possible. If for any reason you can't, sometimes just visiting the school, if that's feasible, um, is a great way to get some exposure and get kind of a gut check about what feels like the right fit as well as some some actual factual data and information to to determine the best possible college to then submit a deposit to. Um, once you have chosen the school, you submit the deposit, which is usually not terribly burdensome, but not insignificant. Um, and then your college advisor will help ensure that the student um, withdraws all other acceptances, um, which actually is really important to do because other kids who may be on the wait list at those colleges are hoping for a spot. So once your student has made a decision, we do really urge them to do the right thing and withdraw their applications from other schools they've been accepted to. And that's when things get very fun. <laughs> Absolutely. So we've we've covered the whole timeline here. Um, and so we wanted to focus a little on first, what are student responsibilities and what are parent responsibilities? Um, so students are responsible for identifying areas of interest. Um, so what are they interested in studying academically? What gets them excited um, in the classroom? Um, what are they always most engaged in with um, their, whether it's their classes, their homework, um, you know, what teachers are they getting along with and what ideas are they learning that's really inspiring. Um, they're also identifying interests through their extracurriculars. What can't they wait to get more involved in outside of the classroom? What really brings them joy outside of their schoolwork, whether that's doing um, service projects or um, athletics or music, um, all of them are wonderful and valid. And our goal is to help them engage not just broadly, but deeply in these extracurriculars too, with the hope that they also develop some real hobbies and passions, um, things that drive them forward in the world and that they're really excited and engaged about. Um, and all of this identifying areas of interest is going to be really instrumental too in helping with the college list and college research. These are, these interests are going to be what drives where students are looking to go to school and identifying those interests is really going to help them realize where their match is going to be at a college or university. So how are they researching their college list? Um, they have to do um, the thought and research necessary to really shape an exciting list. So um, that means thinking deeply about what their interests are, um, think about what aspects they want out of a college experience, you know, what do they want their college experience to look like, and then really digging in deep to the research to see which of those colleges are really going to give them that experience that they're looking for. Um, and we're also wanting them to strive for a balanced list um, so that they have some reaches in there that they're maybe really excited about these colleges or universities. Um, you know, a healthy amount of target colleges where we think that they're well matched um, and that there's a, a good chance that they'll get into. And then, of course, a few likely schools as well um, where students can feel a little more confident that they'll be admitted to those schools. And we build lists this way to ensure that students have great options that they're excited about, um, regardless of um, where they ultimately end up. Um, student responsibilities also keeping all scheduled meetings with their college advisor and essay coach. As you all can see, there's a lot of work to be done on these applications. And the best way for uh, we as advisors and coaches to keep your student on track is 
to be regularly checking in with them and making sure that they're meeting those benchmarks. These meetings aren't just about guiding them, but they can also be very tactical and very practical as well and actually productive in getting the work done in those meetings too. Um, but the, the biggest delays are often caused by um, missed meetings and times when students and those advisors just aren't able to connect. Um, we also are asking students to do independent work between sessions. There is a lot that we can do in those sessions together, as I mentioned, um, but meetings are made a lot more productive when a student is doing outside work. For example, an activities list. Um, I can sit with a student and write down activities and write descriptions together, but it's an even more productive use of our time if a student has a list of all of their activities written and a first draft of um, their descriptions so we can edit them together. Um, this is what helps move things along um, when they've done their independent work outside of our meetings. Will students also need to fill out required applications? Um, so we can <laughs> guide students and we can advise them on how to strategically fill them out. But in the end of the day, they're the ones that need to write the information into all of the fields and make sure that the, the, the work is done there. Um, so that's very important that your student is filling out all of their applications. Um, parents can certainly help with certain logistical aspects. They might also have um, questions about some of the information um, that they're being asked on the application. Um, and students need to do all of the required writing. Um, so things as advisors and essay coaches we cannot do as write essays for students. Um, students, it's very important and it's it's very apparent on the application reviewer side when a student has written something themselves um, versus when it's been written by someone else or um, by an AI. <laughs> um, so we, we know that our families are committed to um, presenting authentic work from each one of our students. And it's very important that students take that seriously um, and, and not honestly filling out applications or not doing all of their required writing are certainly ways that um, applications can go awry in the review process. And that's the last thing that we want for any of our students or families. Um, and then meeting all application deadlines. Um, so all of our deadlines here at Logic Prep are meant to keep students um, ahead of the game and on time. Um, we like to be ahead because if there are things that fall through the cracks, there's a little time to adjust, but not meeting application deadlines is the easiest way to um, get a not positive admissions response. Um, nobody wants to not be admitted somewhere because of a technicality, or nobody wants to miss out on a scholarship because they didn't submit their application on time. We're gonna be keeping track of all of that together, but in the end, it's your student is the one who hit submit. Um, so we we um, need them to, to be on top of that as well. That's their responsibility. Anything to add here, Lauren? No, you, you did a very thorough job there. <laughs> um, I am aware of time and I know we want to leave time um, as much time as we can for questions. So I'm going to talk very, very fast through this slide. Um, in this process, parents, obviously, we know you want to help. And I think there are a lot of ways that you can help. Um, help with logistics, help plan and, and organize college visits, um, you know, help sign up for ACTs and SATs, help, un it, it is very helpful, I think, for students when you as a parent can understand and appreciate your child's strengths and weaknesses, really allow them to shine in areas they do well in and maybe supplement and, and kind of help out in the areas they're, they're struggling with. Um, it's also important to remember that this is not your process. I mean, you are a part of it, but your child really has to have ownership over 
the work itself and ultimately um, in hopefully a very joyful way, the outcome as well. And it's important to have an honest conversation with your students on an ongoing basis um, about many aspects of the application, but what are the things as you are going through this that you know are going to be um, important kind of issues, like how far away you want your child to be when we're talking about location? Um, do you want your child to not be a plane ride away? Um, there are lots of elements of this that it's, you know, you have to be clear with your expectations and also then make it a dialogue, um, you know, with your student about the different elements of uh, the process that are not going to be um, flexible for you. One of the things that is crucially important that we often overlook as parents is some really basic stuff, like does your child know how to handle money independently? Um, even more important than that in some ways, does your child know how to be a respectful and careful decision maker in an often chaotic and free form environment? Um, this may be their first time living in a dorm with two or three other students. Do they know how to clean a bathroom? Do they know how to do their own laundry? Do they know how to be respectful of another person's time and space? These all sound very obvious, but it's really important to ensure that they're fully capable of this level of independence. Um, and this is obviously going beyond college advising fully into the parental sphere, but do they know how to keep themselves physically intact and safe in an environment where there may be drinking, um, for the first time they may be engaging in the kind of behaviors that they haven't had a lot of exposure to in high school? Um, are they going to be prepared to responsibly, respectfully manage these towards other people and more importantly, towards themselves as well? Um, I just talked so fast through that slide, but really want to leave time to answer any questions that you parents have, because that's what we're here for. Awesome. Thank you both so much for such a productive webinar. I feel like it was at least helpful for me as a, as a non-parent to think through kind of what the parent's role really should be in this process. Um, so yes, please put your questions in the Q&A. Um, we did have a couple of questions that were sent in ahead of time. So we'll start with those. Um, and the first one of those questions was asking about um, ways to help your, ch your child if, uh, to become a better reader. Um, I think that's a great question to ask because as you you know internet usage and social media and everything has become more and more popular I do feel like there's definitely a decline in in the number of people overall whether students or adults um who who don't read very much anymore. So what tips do you guys have to encourage uh to have to help parents encourage their students to read more and improve their reading skills? That's a, a great question. And um, I think that, you know, Olivia, you're absolutely right. Things are are very digitized now. Your child is going to do more reading in college than they've ever done before, de depending on their major, perhaps, but it's going to be a lot of reading. Um, one of the things that Olivia does really well um, is she kind of collates from our staff reading lists and suggested readings and um, will send out on social media recommendations of books to read. Um, in our Brazil office, Marillo has a group chat where they're talking about articles and books, and that's an easy way to get involved. Um, the more reading your student does, likely the stronger their essay is going to be because they are going to have a better control over vocabulary and language. Um, and certainly they'll, I think, feel more prepared for expectations in college. Um, so whether it's setting aside family time where you all turn your screens off and sit in the living room with books, um, getting your child a library card, if that's, you know, something that's practical, um, allowing, giving access and making it possible for, for some students, they may not feel comfortable with paper books. Um, downloading books um, is another great way to get them reading, even though it's on a digital platform. 
That's great. Thanks, Lauren. Um, one thing I would add to that too is, is to have um, talk with your, your, your child about what they like to read, because there's so many different types of books out there and not every book is for every reader. Um, and so if you are trying to encourage your student to read more, um, try to figure out what they like. Are they really into murder mysteries? Do they love sci-fi? Um, are they super into history and would like to read more, um, you know, true stories or historical fiction? Um, so try to figure out, um, you know, what what genre or or type of of reading would be appealing to them, and then try to give them as much access to that that type of reading as possible. Because um, it's way easier to read a book if you actually like it. Um, and then we did have a second question that was sent in ahead of time as well, um, which also I think is an excellent question, um, asking about, you know, what happens if our child doesn't get into their favorite college or doesn't get into a college they really want to go to? Um, you know, are there ways to minimize that anxiety? Um, would should it, should the child maybe consider taking a gap year and reapplying? Um, what kinds of strategies do you all recommend? Um, both during the process while it's it's you're thinking about this as a possibility oh no i have this anxiety of what might happen as well as what do you do if that it actually is what happens and and how do you handle that situation great question i'll i'll answer part of it and leave leave the rest for lee i'll just put in my my perspective here um I, I think it's really important throughout this process. And it's one of the things I talk to my students about right away. This is the college application process is one that ultimately you cannot control. Um, and it's a very hard thing for students who are used to, if I put in a certain amount of work, I'm going to get a certain grade and that is going to take me to a certain place in my life. And in this process, while on paper, a student looks like they have everything a college is asking for, that unfortunately is not a guarantee that that student is going to be admitted. And in no way is it a reflection on whether the student could do the work and thrive and be successful there. It is not a negative comment on the student. It's a reality about the college admission process and the competitiveness of it, but also some of the internal mandates that are driving decisions in admission offices. Um, so in terms of anxiety, you know, it is anxiety provoking and it is hard. Um, I have been doing this longer than both Olivia and Leah because I'm a lot older and I can say definitively I have never had a student who was facing originally disappointment. I didn't get into my early decision school. I didn't get into my top choice school. Who ever came back to me later and said, I still regret that. It's the opposite every time. And I'm sure Leah and Olivia have stories about this as well, where students are ultimately usually within days or weeks, so grateful and excited to be where they landed. And I think that, and this goes in my mind a little bit back to some of my previous comments about parents managing their stress and their feelings about this process. Your kids are watching you very, very closely for clues about how they should be handling this process. And if they see in your mind or in your actions or behavior that you're going to be disappointed in them if they don't get into a certain school or you're going to be upset at an outcome, um, it's going to make it even more upsetting and disappointing for them. And I think as, as parents, giving your child the message that you have worked so hard, I know you will thrive at whatever school is lucky enough to get you, can go a long way towards mitigating some of that anxiety that, that goes through this process. Um, having said that, there are actual considerations that need to be made if a student gets disappointing news. Um, Leah, do you want to talk about gap year, potential things students can do if they haven't gotten into one of their top schools and are feeling kind of stuck? Yeah, so in terms of a gap year, I think that first it's, it's important to consider, you know, has your plan been to go to um, university in the fall? And if that has been the plan, you know, 
are there schools available that you are, you know, interested in apply in attending and giving it a shot at? Um, and that's something that I always encourage people to really think about because, um, you know, taking a gap year in, in some ways does delay a little bit, you know, the timeline that you thought you were going to be on. It might be a little bit of a different timeline that your peers are on. Um, it's just something to think about, you know, taking a diversion from that original plan. Um, and something that I also think about with gap years, I, I am a I am a fan of gap years in that it provides students an opportunity to take a little bit of a break from the academics, um, perhaps um, explore um, different opportunities outside of academia, um, whether it be joining some type of volunteer or community service type program, um, maybe traveling a bit, um, perhaps getting an internship or a job somewhere to um, deepen your interest in um, a particular field. Um, but whatever it may be, B, gap years are to do something and do something um, significant. Um, it's an opportunity to keep building um, your resume, so to speak, to keep building experience, to find and deepen interests that a student may have. Because when students do ultimately end up say reapplying to colleges, especially if a student is reapplying to a college that they were um, perhaps previously denied from, the question on the admissions officer's mind is going to be what is different? How has the student grown? How has the student developed? Um, so a gap year can be an option, um, but it is not a relax year. <laughs> it is a get involved and get engaged year. And oftentimes a gap year can also include um, taking a class or two in a particular academic area, if you're trying to improve a grade or a test score to show that you have new um, new academic information, um, that's what we're really looking for at a gap year. So these are some of the things that I encourage people to consider. Any other thoughts on gap years, Lauren or Olivia? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would say very much the same, that we, we also really hope not we we hope to put ourselves in a position of allowing students and families to see their choices in the best possible way and we genuinely believe that students will thrive where they are we've seen it again and again and again so sometimes thinking of a gap year might be an instinctive reaction to a disappointment um, and I think there are a lot of other ways to approach it as well, to see what the possibilities are, to go do some visits, to talk to students who are at those schools, to recognize that the, the ability to be happy, um, to feel excited, and to really engage with the potential for, um, for success at that particular college, it's kind of a matter of making up your mind about it. And we're here to support the conversation. We know it's not a linear process for students and every student has to go through the disappointment and, and the recovery and we're here for that as well. Um, but we're just happy to help problem solve when the time comes. Yeah, I think that sums it up really well. Um, we are just about at the hour, so um, I do want to give one more moment for anyone to put a question in the Q&A. Um, if I don't see any in the next few seconds, I do think we're going to go ahead and sign off. And as always, you all are always welcome to send us additional questions by email, talk to your college advisor or academic advisor at Logic Prep uh, about your questions on how best to support your students through this process. Um, and please, if you have a moment, 
moment to just fill out our survey. I'll be sending it in the chat to everyone right now. We'll also be sending it over email within just a few minutes. Um, so please tell us if you found this helpful, if you feel like it could have been better, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so I'm not seeing any more Q&As uh, jumping into the box. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I hope this webinar was helpful for you. Um, please reach out to us with further questions if you have them, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.